good morning. Has your morning been as busy as mine? I tell you what, this last hour we have been trying to get things set up and I can tell you the enemy has tried to do everything he could to not allow us to have this service this morning. And you know why? It's because something that he does not like is when we stand up here on God's word and we stand upon the truth of the sanctity of life. Folks, you know, he'll, he will fight us and he will fight us. But guess what? The word says what? Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail over it. And you know what? That is so good this morning. It's a great reminder for me to once again trust in him and allow him to work through this whole service. So let me thank you for being here this morning. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, we want to thank you for being here. Uh, just a few quick announcements this morning. Number one, Nursery and Children's Church will be reopening May 16th. May 16th. I know that Joan has a schedule. Uh, we'll get that schedule out to everyone who is on there uh, so that we will know uh, or you will know when and where you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to be uh, doing that. Hopefully by June 1st, we'll have children's Sunday school open. Uh, we're, we're shooting for that first Sunday in June with it. It may be a little bit sooner, but you know what? We're getting ready to crank all this up. So let me tell you to invite any young family with kids uh, because I know that they'll be blessed. I know that everyone is looking forward to coming back. Uh, we're looking forward to VBS this summer. So we're in the stages of planning that. Uh, and we'll get back with you about that too. So uh, just pray and just thank the Lord. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but we opened up the middle section. It looks like everybody noticed that because everybody's sitting in the middle section. But we do have the sides uh, roped off in case you're not comfortable with sitting with everybody. So we still have the sides roped off over the next couple of weeks. We'll see how people respond to that. And then we'll just take them all down June 1st. And we'll just come back and we'll worship uh, together once again like we did prior to all this. Uh, just be praying. Uh, we may be looking to go back to one service here in a, in a month or two just depending on how everything works out. Pray about that uh, for right now as we go through the summer months, but uh, just pray about uh, giving the leaders the wisdom and the knowledge on what we need to do. Youth tonight, 5 p.m., invite any youth, 5 p.m. tonight. We're gonna start uh, something in which they requested. We're gonna talk about being salty in a saltless world, how to have conversations about Jesus in a postmodern world. And I can tell you from last week, uh, these young ones are, are, are ready to go out into Waxhall and share Jesus. You know what? We could learn something from that. There's no doubt about it, folks. We, we need to share Jesus in this postmodern world and, and talk about him and tell others about him. I know uh, Jonathan and I were talking about it this morning that you know what that's where our focus ought to be not on all this other stuff but on sharing jesus christ So that we can go up and we can make a difference in that. Uh, just as a reminder, deacons, there will be no deacon meeting tomorrow. Uh, and we will set that back up next week. I've got a um, thank you note. It says, the Lord your God is with you. It says, dear Waxhaw Baptist team, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to help rebuild homes from Hurricane Florence 
damaged in Newburn, North Carolina. We hope you can come back soon. May God bless each and every one of you in a very special way for your sacrifice of times and talents. Baptist on Missions, Newburn, uh, North Carolina. You know what? Thank you once again for sharing your gifts and your talents and going out there. And what a privilege it is for Waxhaw Baptist Church to be able to send a team out there. So hopefully in the coming uh, days, uh, we'll be able to do that again. Maybe you'll want to go with us next time. I'm doing my best to go with them. I've been asked twice and I just hadn't had time to go, but I want to because it's always a great trip to do that. I don't know of any other announcements uh, if there are any, please let me know. Anybody? Let's set the stage. Psalm 139, verse 14 says, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought, uh, fashioned in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when at yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. You know what? We serve a holy God who knew us before the foundations of the world. And he fashioned you and me in our mother's wombs. He knitted us together. And what a great God and awesome God that he is. And what a great time that we can come in here this morning and learn more about who he is and what he expects from us. So let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. As Ronald comes and he leads us, uh, you all have your hymn books again. So uh, just pull them out and he will let you know what page and prepare your hearts for worship today. If you don't mind standing and take something that we hadn't had our hands on in a year, is our hymnals. Turn to page 344, please. 344, first, second, and last verse. Let us stand together, please. song, right? I mean, just to be able to come together and just be, remind ourselves that Jesus loves us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for the great and awesome God that you are. We thank you, Father, for your many blessings that you give us each and every day. 
We thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your kindness and your compassion. We thank you, Lord, that you're a good God who loves us and who cares for us and is always there for us. And, Father, we just ask that you would just allow us to come before your throne this morning. That, Lord, we would push self aside. Anything that's distracting us in our minds or our hearts, Lord, allow us to put them at your feet. And, Lord, in doing that, then we come and we can confess the sins of our lives. Even this morning, Lord, whatever it may have been. We just ask, Lord, that you would just forgive us. And we thank you for that promise out of 1 John 1, 9. That says if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we just ask that you would just do that right now. Father, we just pray that you would just be with this country. We just ask, Lord, that you would just forgive the leaders of this country, this nation, this state, this community. Father, we just ask that you would just reveal yourself to us mightily through your Holy Spirit. So, Father, as we prepare our hearts, may he fill us this morning. And in doing so, Lord, may you be well pleased. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. And, Lord, may we go out of here knowing that we worshiped in the audience of one. And that's the one true God who loves us and cares for us. For it's in his name, Jesus' name, at the name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. That he is Lord. His wonderful and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just remain standing and turn to page 138. 138, please. First, second, and last verse. It's been a busy morning, there's no doubt about it, but let me thank you for being here and for coming this morning. Yes, we're going to be out of Psalms uh, 139 this morning, verses 14 through 16 or 18. Uh, what a privilege it is to be able to come and be able to talk about the sanctity of life. You know, we usually have a Sunday in January in which we do that. It's Sanctity of Life Day. But we decided that we wanted to partner 
with Love Life Charlotte this, this year. And I can't thank Denise Hindle enough for getting that together. And I know there's a lot of folks uh, that have been involved and want to be involved in Love Life Charlotte. And I trust that at the end of the day, that you know what, you'll make a commitment to at least pray for them. Uh, and Jonathan will come here in a minute and he was going to share with you about the booklets that are setting around you and how to fill those out if you feel led to do that. But what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity it is to be able to talk about the sanctity of life this morning. What is the sanctity of life? A lot of times we don't really know the definition well you know what I went to a great source Wikipedia you know Wikipedia if it's on if it's on the computer it's true right I mean it doesn't matter Facebook Instagram whatever you at it's got to be true but it's a good definition it's the principle of implied protection regarding aspects of life which are said to be wholly sacred and otherwise of such value that they are not to be violated. That's a, good, that's a good definition. You know why? We believe that life is holy. It's sacred. Doesn't matter whose life it is. Because God made us that way. It's the belief that human beings are created by God in his image. Therefore, every person from conception to natural death possesses inherent dignity and immeasurable worth, including preborn children, elderly individuals, those of special needs, and other marginalized by society. You see, we as Christians are called to defend and protect. Folks, we're called to defend and protect. This is a biblical world view that I'm talking about and I'll show you that here in a minute but we're called to defend and protect the value of all human life it's to be respected and it's sacred and that came from uh, Carrie uh, Earl if I'm not mistaken from focus on the family why are we called to defend the sanctity of life it's because it's a biblical worldview. We have all different types of worldviews. There's actually seven different types of worldviews in the world today. But the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview, is the one in which we should adhere to. Why? Because if we call ourselves Christians and followers of Jesus Christ, then we should follow what he says in his word because his word is true. Genesis 127, God created man. Man didn't create man. Animals didn't create man. Animals didn't create animals. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, what? Male and female. He created them. So we live in a world in which everybody wants to say and make God their own way so that they can defend or they can define whatever terms they want to define, right? That's the world in which we live in. And that's why we have so many confused people in this world is because they don't understand that there's a God who's there, a God who cares, who loves them, and who created them for who they are. Not what they want to be, but for what he created them to be and the value that he gave them. You see, a lot of our young folks and uh, younger generation folks want to have this image of the magazines or want to have this image of their friend or whoever it is. And they don't understand that their value comes from a living, loving God who created them uniquely. And a lot of times it overflows into us, too, that we forget that God created man in his own image. The worst person in the world. Whoever you want to put in that place, God loves, and he wants them reconciled to him. Not what we want, what God wants. Psalm 139, 14, I just read. At, at the very beginning of the service, it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made and your works are wonderful. I know the full, uh, I know that full well. So we praise God because why? He made us. He did us in the womb, folks. 
He's the one that put us all together. He's the one that already knows what and how our life's going to be from the very beginning to the very end. So you know what? We need to put that biblical world view into perspective. We need to understand as we come and we talk about the sanctity of life and as we come and we minister even with Love Life Charlotte that it's because of God's view on this that we do this. It's a biblical worldview. You've heard me for the last nine years talk about a biblical worldview. This is a great, great case of that. Now, why do we need to defend it? Because God's word tells us to. It says, do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but what? Sanctify, set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make what? A defense, always giving a reason for your faith, always telling people why you believe and what you believe and why you believe that and, and being able to tell them out of God's word where that's at. To everyone who asks you to give an account, an answer for the hope that is in you. Yet with gentleness and reverence. You know what? We're not here to win an argument. We're here to present the truth of a loving God to folks who don't understand his view of who they are and how they should live. You see, we're not there to argue the point because arguing a point will not bring someone to the Lord. The Holy Spirit does that. We're just supposed to be obedient in giving the answers in gentleness and reverence and keep a good conscience so that in the things which you are slandered, you know what? Those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. You see what happens is is that even if you might even go up here to love life, you might hear people yelling at us. They may be saying things about it. But it's all right. You know what? We're supposed to be gentle in that. We're not supposed to retaliate. They may slander us or they may revile us because of our behavior in Christ. But you know what? It's just like with Jesus. Pilate asked, are you the king? And he said, correctly, I am the king of my kingdom. And then he didn't say another word after that. He just allowed his life and his teachings to put an end to that slander and that revival. Of course, his death, burial, and resurrection then. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing something that's wrong. We don't like to suffer, do we? Folks, it's just a common, common denominator. We do not like to suffer. And you know what? When you defend the faith, when you, when you tell people about abortion or euthanasia, or genocide, whatever it is, you're going to suffer from the culture in which we live in. Why? Because they don't know what else to do. It's because the father of all lies have what? Blinded them. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So you know what? If you're going to stand up for Jesus Christ, even through abortion, talking to people about abortion, your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, your friends, your neighbors, whoever it is, you may get reviled for that. They might get really nasty with you. But you're supposed to show them the love of Jesus Christ in that. And let them know that God still loves them. That you love them. And that you're just trying to get them to think through their view of things. Because their worldview has probably been put together by TV, media, maybe mom and dad who's not a Christian, maybe their friends and whom they're hanging out with. You see, they've got a lot of influences that we don't think about, but we know the truth because God's word tells us that number one, that life is sacred and holy. Number two, that his view on it is right. And number three is that we should defend that view no matter what. Mark 12, 30, 31 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you know what? You say, oh, Chris, yeah, mm, that's the two greatest commandments. Yep. 
That's the Ten Commandments shrunk into two. Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to shrink these into two so you can remember them. The first one covers the first four or five you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. You see, you can't do the second one without the first one. If you don't know who God is, if you don't know who uh, he is, or who, what Jesus has done, or who his word is, you, then you can't do the second one. Which is loving your neighbor as yourself. Because the only way that you can love your neighbor as yourself is by loving God with everything that you have. And a lot of times we don't want to love the Lord with our mind. We, we say, yeah, I love him with all my heart and with all my soul. But when it comes down to talking to people about these things, about sanctity of life or, or suffering and evil or, or whatever it is, we don't want to learn. And in doing that, then we don't really love the Lord with all of our mind, do we? But when we get that down and when we understand that the Lord wants all of us, not just part of us. Then we know how to love our neighbor as ourselves. We got to understand, folks, that if we talk to people about this issue. That there's a force behind them. That Paul says in Ephesians 6. And that force is the devil. Who's using them. As a segue into trying to move his view, his agenda in. It's not flesh and blood. It's the force behind it that we need to be prepared for. I love Proverbs 38, uh, 3.18. It says, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of those who are destitute. Isn't that a great, great Bible verse, especially about the sanctity of life? There's many who can't defend themselves. You know what? We need to teach. We need to give answers to others. Why? We need to tell them who's in control. That God is in control. That we're not. God's in control. That abortion is wrong morally. I don't care what it is or the statement that you want to make. It's morally wrong. Why looking down on those with disabilities are wrong. There's a lot of people that do that. Why the age is supposed to be respected. You know what? In other countries, you get to a certain age, all your medical care ceases. They won't do it. Why life is precious and it should be uh, respected. Here you go. Eight weeks old. Right there. Eight weeks. You got the placenta. You got the umbilical cord, the liver, the eyes, the sac, the brain. Eight weeks. Here's the arguments. We just saw them, right? We just saw at eight weeks. Of course, when you have the, the, the zygote, you know, the egg and the sperm come together, it creates a new being, the zygote, right? And we'll talk about that right here in a minute. We've got the rape argument. And the rape argument is a sensitive argument. And I understand that. It's horrible. And whoever does that should be punished to the full extent of the law. But less than 1% of your rape victims will conceive just because of the horde of the crime. Two, right, or two wrongs don't make a right. You know what? That baby did nothing. It did nothing. It's hard, I know. I've read articles. I've talked to people. It's hard. I've heard testimonies of where the person, mom, had been raped. And they were standing in front of the church, in front of the public, testifying that abortion was wrong. Because they had a chance. It's a tough, tough talk. There's no doubt about it. But what needs to be said in that, if you ever sit across from somebody, is first of all that you say, you know what, I am so sorry. And that should have never happened. 
But let me tell you about a God who loves you. A God who cares for you. And a God who cares for that child. And has a plan for them. And whatever you think, please, please don't think that it was your fault. Because it wasn't. Then, and I've talked to people with this. You know what? I got a career. I got to walk up the ladder. I've got to get to, I've got certain plans that I've got to do. So I don't have time for this. It's a very selfish argument. I don't mind telling you. You have time to mess around, but then you don't have time for the consequences afterwards. But you know what? There's a loving God who will forgive you for this. And will give you the strength to show you the need to carry this baby. Part of the body. This is the biggest argument. This is the argument that you hear from the political end of it. It says, you know what? Uh, the woman said, well, it's a part of my body. The baby is a part of my body. No, it's not. It's not a part of your body. The womb is a place for development. The placenta attaches to the lady. The umbilical cord goes to the baby and feeds off of that. But you see, the baby has its own genetic code already. You know what? If it was part of the woman's body, there would be no males born. There would only be females. Think about it. But we have usually a 50-50 thing. You have 50% boys, 50% girls. So that's not a good argument. But that's the most argument that I've heard, or the major argument that I've heard over the years that I've sat down with people. But you just need to talk to them a little bit about science. And talk to them a little bit about God and how uh, he wants them to see that this is an individual that he created and that uh, you know, the things in which they're being fed is not true. It's all right to stand on truth, folks. It's all right to disagree with someone, even in this culture, and says you're intolerant, you're insensitive, you're whatever. It's all right to disagree with folks. Stand on the Word of God and be obedient. And tell them about these things that are untrue. Unborn, not alive until the first breath. We talked about it. New life starts at conception, right? You got a sperm and an egg, and then you, they come together, and you got a whole different being called a zygote. Attaches to the uterine wall. At that point in time, it's got 20, uh, the, the, the baby has 23 chromosomes from the mother and father. The hair, the eye, the skin, bone structure is already determined at that point in time. And what happens is when you tell folks that, when you tell folks that, a lot of times they can't come back with anything because they don't know it. Because they were just told by this by their friend or their moms or, or a doctor or whoever. But when you come back with real evidence, you see, they can't, they can't say anything. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful how the Bible speaks to all of life if we'll just... Sit down and study it a little bit. How about it purifies the gene pool? Boy, I tell you, this is the hardest one for me. Because when I look across from people and they say, oh, well, it'll purify the human race. It purifies the abortion. You know what? It, it, it really, I have to have self-control with this. Who are you to judge whether this person is holy and sacred? just because they may have a challenge in front of them. We don't do this to people that are already challenged, do we? Why would we do it to a baby? It's a selfish argument. God doesn't make mistakes. God knows exactly where that baby's at, no matter what that challenge may be. And then, this is the old argument, it prevents backstreet abortions. 
if you look at backstreet abortions and you start looking at some of the uh, statistics on it, what it doesn't show is that when those were legal, there were about 45 total deaths a year from backstreet abortions, and it was because they didn't have antibiotics. All the people died from antibiotics. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't prevent that. So you know what, when you start looking at it and you start reading it and you start researching it and you start having these conversations with people, guess what? It makes them think because they're hearing something different than what the world's telling them. They're hearing the truth and the Holy Spirit works on their hearts and their minds and he shows them and demonstrates to them the truth of what life's all about. See, I told you I could get the Holy Spirit in this, right? You know, I, I told you I was going to go off of the dynamic series for a, for a while, for the next week or two. But I can always bring the Holy Spirit into whatever we're talking about. He's alive and well. So here's questions for consideration for the church. Besides voting or supporting the government... The church or parachurch organization, okay? You know what? A lot of us say, oh, well, we'll vote for these people, and they'll, they'll do the laws and everything. We're supposed to do that, but it goes deeper than that, folks. It's not up to Washington. It's up to us individually. How are you making an impact in the next generation about sanctity of life issues? How are you teaching the next generation about morality about abortion about uh you know the elder generation about genocide about euthanasia and about suicide see that's a little bit different question than saying well you know what our politicians will do that i vote for the politicians well that's easy it's almost like saying, you know what, God, I trust you in this situation just like Moses did. And God said, why are you laying on your face right now before me? Go and do it. That's what he's saying to the church. He's saying, why are you putting all your faith in? As the church, we're supposed to move forward. We're supposed to be in the truth and be the light. Don't throw it on somebody else. Are you waiting for someone else to do it? You see, man, I hear that all the time. Well, Chris, you know what? You're trained in that. Uh, yeah, but you know what? I'm trying to train other people into understanding how they can have that conversation. It's what I'm doing with the youth even tonight and for the next four or five weeks. How they can sit across from their friends and say, look, you know what? No, let's look at it this way. That's why I have classes here, so that we can be trained to have those conversations. Sitting back complaining about it, but not providing a solution to the problem, isn't that a lot of America? All complaining everything about it, but not ever providing solutions. Boy, that's a, that's a living example up in Washington. They like to gripe and complain and get at each other but there's always no solutions let me challenge you to read the gospels and how jesus made an impact in the culture he lived in let me tell you something folks jesus made an impact in people's lives one at a time it's not a social gospel it's not this great big thing jesus impacted people one life at a time where he was locally that's how he changed the culture around him. Jesus didn't force things on people. The culture was changed through the teaching of his word by all of his followers, wherever they were located, no matter the place. Go to Acts. See Paul, see Philip, see the deacons, see the apostles. See all the people who were involved in the churches. They were the ones who went out and believed the gospel who believed that Jesus came to make a difference. And what happened? Lives were transformed and cultures were transformed. If you do any research on revivals, what you will see is it's first individual. Then it's a couple more individuals. Then it's corporately. 
And then it spreads into the community. Laws can be made on abortions. Euthanasia or whatever, they're still broken. You say, oh, no, Chris, you know what? No, you know what? There's 55 mile an hour speed limit signs all over the place. How many of us obey that? See, laws can be broken all the time. It's up to us as believers in Jesus Christ to tell people the truth. You see, it's the heart that must be changed. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. But he wants to use us individually and as a church and corporately to be able to go out and, and talk to hearts about his love and his mercy and his grace. I'm pretty sure Albert Einstein said this. I looked it up, and I, I'm pretty sure it's, it's not one of those false facts. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but those who watch them without doing anything. What do you think? To change the thinking of the culture around us, we must first show the love of Jesus Christ. To change the culture around us, we must take advantage of the open doors we have to teach others about the biblical worldview on these subjects. Are we really the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus Christ in teaching these issues to the next generation? Instead of complaining, instead of trusting in the government to do it, how about you and I and the church do it together? Prayer changes people in the culture. You know what? You can't do things. You can't. You can pray. You can pray. Prayer is one of the most important things to do. You say, Chris, I can't talk to people. I don't know everything. Just pray. Pray that God would change hearts. Pray that God would give their leaders of the churches and, and folks who understand all this to, to go out and to have courage to do it. Jesus transforms people to come from the darkness into the light. Folks, love covers a multitude of sin. You've heard me say this before. If you've been a part of an abortion or you've been had an abortion, God still loves you. And he can cleanse you from that. Doesn't matter. He can cleanse you and he can forgive you. And he can take that and he can make you one of the best witnesses that he has on this issue. If you'll sit and talk about it. Don't ever think. He can, he can take that guilt and that shame and cast it as far as the east is to the west. He don't keep a number of wrongs. We can demonstrate to others God's views on these issues through telling them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can tell them of the forgiveness and then we can change the world one person at a time. That's all we need to do. One person at a time. Here's a song. And this I'm going to end it and then I'm going to introduce Jonathan from uh, Peterson. He was going through a tough time in his life. And it says, no one understands like Jesus. He's a friend beyond compare. Meet him at the throne of mercy. He is waiting for you there. No one understands like Jesus. Every woe he sees and feels. Tenderly he whispers comfort and the broken heart he heals. No one understands like Jesus when foes of life assail. You should never be discouraged. Jesus cares and will not fail. No one understands like Jesus when you falter on the way. Though you fail him, sadly fail him, he will pardon you today. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. No one is so near, so dear as Jesus. Cast your every care on him. You know what? That's a great, great song. Because it tells us that we have a God and a Savior who is there and who cares just something to think about folks over this next few weeks few months let me introduce you to Jonathan DeVoe he is with Love Life Charlotte and Jonathan's going to share a couple things with us this morning so Jonathan you come you share with us
and you close it out the way that you see fit. Okay? Yes, sir. Sure will. Good morning. Well, it's a privilege and an honor to be here today. Um, welcome to Love Life Week 13 of our Week 40 prayer journey together. I'm excited, and it's an honor and a privilege for me to stand before you today. Um, just want to take a moment and just say I just want to honor uh, Pastor Chris Whitaker and his wife Laura. I, I tell you, it is with when Love Life it, without the pastors and elders of churches leading the charge on this issue. I can come up here and speak and you can see a face and never see me again. But when the pastors and the elders take a stand and they preach the sanctity of life and they understand the value of life and it begins at conception, it, we, so we honor you. Um, thank you, Chris and Laura as well. Um, the amazing thing is, um, and I'll go into some, some things here as we uh, go along this presentation, but I've only been in this role for two weeks. So God's been very gracious, very kind. And I want to say thank you to each one of you for welcoming me in this morning, um, being away from my wife and two children. Um, I'm also a pastor at Convergent Church. Uh, it's basically we meet in Uptown Charlotte, um, but I'm thankful to be a part of this family. You know, and that's the beautiful thing about the church. We're family. Man, we've been covered under the blood of Jesus and, and he's invited us into his family and we are his children. And so therefore we are brothers and sisters in Jesus. And, uh, so I just want to just start off with this quick video, um, the really love life. We want to see more videos like this. We want to see thousands more stories, uh, like Nicole here. Oh, maybe, sorry, maybe that's the next slide. My apologies. So the mission at love life is to unite and mobilize the church, which is you and I to create a culture of love and life that will bring an end to the abortion and the orphan crisis. It is not just the babies in the womb. It is also the orphans and the widows. Is it on? We're good. Okay, good. Um, Jesus said in Luke 137, for nothing is impossible with God. Amen to that. Sorry, this slide is, I thought it was going to have a video, but maybe it does not. As you can tell, this is my first time doing this. There was a video that I really wanted to show of Nicole's story, but it was there a minute ago, but now it's not there. But um, God's in control. Um, so the Lord's in control. But it is, uh, it is the, the church will end abortion. It, as, as Pastor uh, Chris said earlier, it is not politicians. It is not casting a vote, casting a ballot of who's pro-life and who isn't. The church will end abortion. It is our time to respond. God has called the church to shape the culture and the politicians and legis legislation will follow. The tragic truth about abortion in the United States. Abortion is the leading cause of death in the U.S. Let that sink in for a second. It's not cancer. It's not heart disease. It's abortion. Babies being killed. 17,000 babies are killed weekly in the U.S. 17,000 lives that are ended. Abortions are allowed up to birth in some states. In New York, you can have an abortion the day before that baby is born. It's detestable and it's sick. Here in North Carolina, you know, the plastic babies, and it is crazy. The baby out front is 12 weeks. One in four women and men will have an abortion in their lifetime. We say and men because we believe that this is just as much of a man's issue as it is a woman's issue. If men of God were to take their rightful place as God has designed them to be and said, no, we will care for this child, then we believe that abortions would end. It is on the men of God as well to help lead this charge. Abortions identify as Christian, which is a staggering evangelical church once in the past month. And I will tell you now, it is me. I'm a post-abortive father. I would have a 21-year-old son or daughter right now. 
Got my girlfriend pregnant at the time. I was living a life of destruction, heading to hell. I didn't care who I was stepping over or stepping on as long as I was first. And I was apathetic about the issue. And I told her, I said, you can make a choice. I'll, cho I'll support you no matter what you, what you do. Well, I should have said, no, we're going to have this life. We're going to have this baby. We drove over to Hebron. I sat in the waiting room while she had an abortion. And our relationship after that was never the same. It destroyed our relationship. I am a post-aborted father, but God has redeemed that. He has removed my sin as far as the east is from the west. And I bear that shame and that guilt no more. And I will not let Satan offer me lies of deceit that I am not good enough to stand here and declare that to, to you. God is good. He is in the restoring and redeeming game. <laughs> he's good at it. And he's gracious. And I'm thankful for that. And now I get to be a voice and a mouthpiece to say abortion is wrong and there is a better way. At Love Life, we are not about shame and condemnation, but we are about healing and restoration. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We believe, as Pastor Chris said, and the word of God says, that love covers a multitude of sin. So we will look back at what God has done. This is a God thing. This is not a love life thing. This is not anything else. This is God himself as what he has done through the local church, through the body and through love life. Here's some highlights from the past five years. We have seen over 2,806 babies saved. Come on. Yes. 2,000 plus in Charlotte alone. Wow, up to 70% drop in abortions on Wednesdays and on Saturdays. Wednesdays are our days of concentrated prayer and fasting. And Saturdays, guess what? The light shows up in the darkest areas of our city. And we make a presence there. And 70% uh, of women run away. 82,000 plus people. And these numbers are just climbing. I mean, I, we can't even keep up with it. People have prayer walked. It's amazing. 400 plus partnering churches. And you guys are one. So praise the Lord for Waxhaw Baptist. We have seen 28 and climbing abortion workers. They have felt compelled to leave the industry. We, we are out there. Um, our office is at Latrobe. And we tell people going in and out of the call center when they receive these calls. The, uh, we'll go down there on Saturday. And I won't give too much away. But you just tell them abortionworker.com, let us help you find another job. We want to help you get out of this industry. People feel trapped, but over 28 have left. Over 2,700 people have connected beyond the prayer walks, whether that's being a mentor, orphan care, sidewalk counseling in our outreach team, as well as helping hands. And we believe that prayer is the key. We believe that as Jesus said in Matthew, oh goodness, sorry, forgive me here. This is, okay, there we go. And we, so we believe that pray, prayer is the key. As Jesus said in Matthew um, 16, verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We believe that in the power of prayer. We believe that by the power of prayer that God responds in accordance with his people's prayers. We believe it. So as you see, today is week 13. And this is your church adoption week. Sunday through Saturday. I want everyone to say it behind me. Say here. Pray, Pray. Go. go, connect. Yes. All right. So today here is really hearing this charge, raising awareness, education of what abortion is, the sanctity of life as Pastor Chris preached on, an awareness of this issue. We believe that this is the greatest moral issue of our time. We also believe that we're asking for your commitment as you guys have committed before in the past. 
We also ask that for, for prayer on Wednesday that the church, not just Waxhaw Baptist, but Ebenezer Baptist and other churches that are partnering this week, week 13, will join us in praying and fasting on Wednesday if you're able to fast. But pray. Again, we saw the number 70% drop. It's amazing when you see the power of prayer as we cry out and we plead with God. It works, church. It works. And we ask that you would go on Saturday, the church prayer walk at the abortion center, the southeast largest abortion center. Think about these numbers. At Latrobe Drive, there are 150 to 200 babies killed every week there. Just imagine if you got a news report right now and you said there's going to be an attack on a school and 200 children will be killed. What would you do? Would you call the FBI? Would you call the police? Would you yourself get in a car and say, I will do whatever it takes to stop that? Of course we would, because we value life. So we will go to the darkest place in our city. And quickly, there are four abortion centers in the U.S., I mean, uh, in, in Charlotte. Latrobe, Hebron, Wendover, and also a Planned Parenthood as well. But that is the biggest in the Southeast, above every other one. Miami, Atlanta, Raleigh, Greensboro, Orlando, Jacksonville. It's here in our backyard in Charlotte. And then after you go to the prayer walk, I got to fix the time. It's actually 9 to 1030. We would ask that you wouldn't get involved, that the Holy Spirit is prompting in your life to get involved further than just a prayer walk. There are multiple opportunities and multiple ways that you can be, you could put your action, your steps in place, your steps of obedience, whether that's through restored life, like myself being a post abortive father, a prayer walk champion, a mentor, sidewalk counseling and outreach, orphan care, and financial investment. Let me just quickly, I feel like the, the Holy Spirit's telling me right now, it's like, I just wanna share this. Yesterday in Charlotte, at Latrobe, it was a beautiful story. Actually, there's been so many amazing stories. I could go on and speak about this for an hour. Yesterday, the church was showing up. We were worshiping and we were praying. That's all we were doing. We don't engage with the pro aborts We don't engage with other people as they're mocking, as they're challenging us and saying all sorts of things. We just pray. We just pray. This woman was pulling into the parking lot yesterday. The sidewalk counseling team was reaching out and handed her some pamphlet about hope is here. Let us help you. And she thought she was there for an ultrasound, but the abortionist, the way how cunning they are and how they lie, they ask for two things when you go in the door. They ask for your ID and your method of payment. That's it. You're going to pay for this abortion before you're even sent back to the back. And they take your phone as well. So you can't do research on your phone about what an abortion is. Hey, you're this. And she was coming there for an ultrasound. But the problem is, is that they do the ultrasound. Then they give you the results after you have the abortion. Think about that after it's done. And then she it was instantly scared. This young lady, she didn't know she was confused. They said, listen, our mobile RV ultrasound unit will be here in about 15 minutes. Will you just drive down the road? She stopped. She went and talked to this lady, Vicki. She surrendered her life to Jesus yesterday. The gospel was proclaimed. Two babies were saved yesterday because the church showed up and prayed. The gospel was shared and she said, I am undone. I am a man or a woman of unclean lips. Save me, Lord. I mean, well, that's awesome. Gets me choked up. And all of heaven was rejoicing in that moment when she confessed Jesus as Lord. It's awesome. So I'm just calling you to action. To believe is to commit. You'll see on page 10 of this vision booklet. You'll see right here, there's a QR code. And on the back of that QR code, you will see a commitment card. I want to pray over this church, but I also quickly want to share um, or to give you guys a minute just to go ahead and start filling this card out. If you feel that the, that the Lord is prompting you right now, that you can connect and that you can do these steps with us this week, as we're raising awareness, we're educating of the issue of abortion, of what it is, and you can pray and fast or pray anything on Wednesday. And if you can show up on us on Saturday just to worship 
and pray and stand in the gap for these mothers who are choosing death. They, are, they literally have appointments to, to kill their baby. If you can do that and bring a chair, literally bring a, bring a chair and fold out just, and hang out out with there. I'm telling you, when the church shows up, the light shows up in the darkness, darkest areas, the darkness must flee. It has to. It doesn't have a choice. The only reason why darkness exists is because the light is not present. So come and be there. And if you can commit to that, I'm going to give you a minute to fill this out right now. Please come forward. Um, and while you're filling that out, I want to share one other story, just the power of what is happening really with Love Life and just what's happening with the tragedy of abortion. This past week, there was this woman that showed up and she just pulled up right to the sidewalk counseling team. And we thought that she was going in there for an abortion. That's, that was my my thought, um, there was two or three women that were ministering to this woman. And the amazing thing is, is that she came back to this place two years ago, she had an abortion and she just wanted to go to that property and lament her baby being killed. And she was wailing. She was crying. She was just broken over her sin. And she says, I want my baby back. I want my baby. I mean, and they were able to minister to her and share Jesus and the hope of salvation. But this is, these are the stories that happen over and over in our darkest places. And if you have, if you have I, I want to pray for everyone quickly. If we could just really quickly bow our heads. And I'm going to pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day. Lord, you are good and you care deeply for us and you care deeply, Lord, for your, your people and you care, Lord, for life. Lord, you care for life. At 17 days, God, as you know, Lord, there's a heartbeat and a baby, a heartbeat. God, you created us in our most innermost being, male and female, Lord, you created us. Lord, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Help us, Lord, to see the tragedy and the reality of what is happening in this nation, in our own backyard. God, forgive us, Lord, for our level of apathy in this situation of abortion. Lord, just heal us. Heal this land. Help us to repent. Lord, we need you. And I just pray now, Holy Spirit, as only you can do, that you would stir in the hearts of men and women here to feel compelled and led to say, Lord, here I am, send me. Lord, here I am, send me. And I pray that in the powerful name of Jesus, amen. If you have filled out one of these commitment cards, I just want to take a moment and just pray for you too. Um, actually, quickly, let's, let's bow our head again. Sorry, I'm just feel led to do this. If you in this room have filled out a commitment card, whether it's through a QR code or through, uh, through actually filling it out, I, I just ask right now that you would raise your hand in this room. Just everyone raise your hand. If you, or if you haven't had a chance and you want to, and you're going to raise your hand, please. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I want to pray for those that have looked at this issue and said, this is important. And I just want to just pray over them now that you would embolden them, empower them, help them uh, by the power and presence of the spirit of God, Lord, that you would um, just stir in them and continue to help them help us as a church to stand in the gap, to not just talk about it at a sermon or just to vote on a, a political scale, but to actively say, that abortion is wrong, that hope is here. Jesus is better. Jesus, you are good to us and you care for life. And I just pray it in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. That's really all I have this morning. Um, did you want to close? Yeah. And Ronald's going to come up and he's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. Well, thank Jonathan. Did not know that about Jonathan, folks. Did not know that about him. What a, 
what a powerful testimony that uh, that he had. Yes, sir. Don't know it. Just met him this morning, but I love him. I tell you what, anybody to share his heart like that understands that that Jesus forgives and that he wants to make uh, him uh, a witness for him. I tell you, that's powerful. And I thank you, Jonathan. And thank you for for willing to sacrifice not only at your church, but with love life too. So thank you. Love y'all. Yes, sir. Ronald's going to come. He's going to lead us in the hymn of invitation. It's all right. I know it's 5 till 10. We'll get Sunday school going. It's all right if it goes till 10 after. It, it's just one of those Sundays, okay? Uh, so we're all good. But you know what? You respond. However God's leading you, you respond this morning as Ann and as uh, Ronald comes and leads us. Let's stand together, please. Page 275. 275. <laughs> for being here this morning i trust that your hearts have been blessed number one that they've been challenged number two and that this just won't fall on deaf ears doesn't matter where you're at what you want to do you can always pray always pray no matter if you're in the car at home at work whatever it may be you can always pray for those who are leading uh, this charge if you did fill out a commitment card this morning or that if you're going to before you leave, please leave it on the back table back there. Or Jonathan will probably be back there and he can collect those. Next week, we need to meet here at 7.30. If we got to be up there by 9, we probably need to meet here around 7.30. Uh, give us an hour to get up there, get situated and everything. We'll leave the parking lot at 7.30 Saturday morning. Come with us on Tuesday at prayer time. Nine o'clock, as we pray specifically for this and the church, come back Wednesday night as we pray specifically about what we're doing. And I know that uh, you'll be blessed in doing that. So it's good to see you this morning. Let me thank you for being here and let us dismiss. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we just come before your throne just rejoicing at hearing of those who you have transformed their hearts, Lord, who have saved their babies. We thank you, Lord, of those who were involved, but yet somewhere down the line they understood, asked for forgiveness, and Lord, you have used them mightily and you continue to use them mightily in this battle because they understand that you love them and that you have forgiven them. And Father, that you're a great God because you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross and to be buried and raised again so we can have victory in this life and the life to come and, and the gift of the Holy Spirit who reminds us each and every day that we're your children and that you love us and you've forgiven us. So Father, I pray that as we walk into this battle each and every day that Lord, we would remind the enemy that he has no say in our lives. That Lord, even when he gets between our ears and we know that it's him because it's condemnation and it's all this hollering and everything else that we could say, Lord, don't want to hear that. Satan, get away. You have no right over me for I am a child of Jesus Christ. And Father, in that, may we be reminded once again of your love and your mercy, your grace and your forgiveness. 
So, Lord, as we leave this place today, may our hearts and lives be changed and challenged. And may we glorify you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.